Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. December 8th, 2017. 105 here on the great WRKO. Okay, jam-packed show for you today at 120. Stunning, I mean bombshell, report from the state auditor about the Department of Children and Families. You don't want to miss it. 205, we have got the Barnstable County Sheriff, who's now under fire for, listen to this, for wanting to check the immigration status of inmates in correctional facilities who are guilty of murder, rape, and other violent crimes. What the hell is going on in Cape Cod? And another huge revelation. This time, one of the accusers of Roy Moore admits she forged the yearbook. She actually now has admitted it. We've got all of that, so much more, but first as he always does, or usually does, uh, at this time on the Cooner Report. We are now joined by former U.N. Ambassador, Fox News analyst, John Bolton. Ambassador Bolton, thank you so much for coming on the Cooner Report. Well, glad to be with you. Ambassador, I've got a lot of things I want to ask you, but the first one to me, the obvious question, Trump has now angered many people, the UN, the Europeans, the Muslim world, even the Pope, for his decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Did the president make a mistake in your view, or is he just simply recognizing reality? I think it was exactly the right thing to do. Look, uh, the United States Embassy uh, is in the capital city of essentially every other country we recognize. Uh, the only real exception is Israel. And, and what the president did was, uh, as he said in the speech, as you just said, recognize the reality that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Now, people have said, oh, but this is going to jeopardize the final status negotiations over Jerusalem. The president was very careful to say that uh, he wasn't making any comment about what Jerusalem's border should be, what Israel's border should be. The embassy will be in West Jerusalem territory that Israel has had uh, since independence uh, for the modern state. Uh, he's gone out of his way to make it clear that uh, that this is something that doesn't have a political impact. So for all those who are upset by it, I, said, I, I guess I just say, I'm sorry your illusions are being punctured, but guess what? After 70 years of looking, we have found the capital of Israel. How about that? Um, Ambassador, I agree with you a thousand percent, uh, but you know, let me just ask you, play a little bit the devil's advocate for a second. I understand from a certain point maybe why the Palestinians would be angry. I disagree with them, but I can sort of understand it. But what about Turkey? You've got Erdogan, the Islamist dictator of that country, saying that basically they've pulled a pin on a bomb by this decision. He's now calling for a conference of all Muslim nations, saying now that Trump has crossed what he says is the Muslim world's red line. What is it Turkey's business, whether uh, Jerusalem or East Jerusalem belongs to the Israelis or to the Palestinians? Why are the Turks getting involved in something that is ultimately none of their business? Well, it is none of their business, that's right. I think Erdogan is making a play, uh, as he has been in a number of other respects, uh, to be the, the leader of the Islamic world, and particularly the radical Islamic world. In, inside Turkey, which uh, I think he's trying to split away from the West, split away from the NATO alliance, There's uh, he's he's been hard at work for years to undermine the secular constitution that Kemal Ataturk wrote, for the country after World War I when the Ottoman Empire broke up. Uh, there are some people who uh, predict that uh, in a few years on the 100th anniversary of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, when the last Islamic caliphate was extinguished, that Erdogan will declare that once again Turkey is the center of, uh, of that caliphate. So I think there's a lot of politics going on here. There's a lot of uh, rivalry within the uh, Islamic world, Iran, obviously, on one side, Saudi's on another, Turkey's got their own side to this, uh, and they're using this as a convenient excuse to advance their own interest. But, you know, from the U.S. perspective, and again, that's the perspective we ought to be uh, care caring about, uh, for many years, this threat that 
the U.S. will have crossed a red line, that the Arab street will be uh, will have a violent reaction, that uh, basically Americans and American uh, friends all over the region will be in jeopardy. That, that, that is a physical threat. It's a kind of intimidation. Uh, and since for years we appeared to succumb to that kind of intimidation, I think it encouraged it to continue and encouraged others to believe that the United States could be intimidated. So simply uh, declaring reality to be what it is, uh, which President Trump did yesterday, is very threatening to the political interests of many of our adversaries, uh, which is another good reason to do what the president did. Ambassador, I just I want to pivot to the FBI because there is it's now in the crosshairs of so many Republicans, so many conservatives, uh, frankly, even from many independent observers. And what we've now found out is that the FBI under Obama essentially became a political arm of the Hillary campaign and in many ways of the Obama administration. We now know that Peter Strzok was a key player, a rabid Hillary supporter who did everything he could to protect and coddle Hillary during the FBI's investigation and encouraged Mueller and the FBI to go after Trump. We've now uh, found out about Andrew Weissman, top deputy of Mueller, uh, a top FBI investigator, was sending um, text messages to Sally Yates, cheering her on for openly defying the president when he wanted her to enforce his travel ban. In fact, the Wall Street Journal broke today that apparently Andrew Weissman is such a Hillary partisan that he actually went to her party, her election night party, the night of the election. And so my question now to you is this. Under Comey, did the FBI become fatally compromised and politicized? And do we need a special counsel? I know you don't like special counsels, but do we need another special counsel this time to investigate Hillary because the first one was obviously rigged and a sham? Well, I think Comey uh, and others have done incredible damage to the FBI. And, you know, I want to say over the years during the time I was at the Justice Department, at the times I've been in the State Department, I've worked with the FBI on uh, law enforcement matters. I've worked with them on counterintelligence matters. I've worked with them on the confirmation of federal judges, nominees to the Supreme Court. Uh, I've worked with them on countless things. And for for the average FBI agent, and indeed up until recently for the entire institution, I had nothing but profound respect. But I have to say the past couple of years of one revelation after another, and especially just in the last couple of months, weeks really, uh, the things that you're revealing have, have shaken me, shaken me very badly. Uh, I can't believe uh, that the behavior that, that, uh, that we've been talking about here is reflective of the overwhelming majority of FBI agents. But I do worry that under the Clinton and then the Obama years, not much corrected under the Bush administration because Mueller and Comey were FBI directors, that a politicization has uh, crept into the FBI that it uh, that it's reflected in a very partisan way, uh, and and that uh, it's no wonder that many Americans who who are already deeply skeptical uh, of the impact that Obama's had on the government now worry that he's corrupted the FBI. And I don't mean in a monetary sense; I, I something far worse than that, corrupted the integrity and independence of the FBI. So, uh, you know, as, as you said, I don't like uh, special counsels. Uh, I don't deny that. Uh, Jeff Sessions has that opportunity as attorney general. I think the FBI would be much better advised to cooperate fully with Congress. We, we don't see that happening, even under the new FBI director. He had a lot of opportunities in his hearing yesterday, uh, Director Ray, to uh, demonstrate that cooperation. He chose not to do it. I think that's a mistake. I think, I think the uh, pressure is going to build, and I think the, the worry, the concern, the distrust that many people feel uh, is just going to increase if the FBI uh, continues to stonewall. We are talking with former U.N. Ambassador, Fox News analyst, John Bolton. Uh, Amba uh, Ambassador, you and I rarely talk, obviously, on domestic politics or the economy. But I have to ask you this question. The jobs report now is out, November, 228,000 new jobs. Since Trump was elected, these are official government statistics, 2.2 million new jobs created. 
the manufacturing unemployment rate is at a record low, so manufacturing is booming, and even the Hispanic, the Latino unemployment rate is at 4.7%, the lowest in American history. The economy is now booming under President Trump. Do you think as the economy continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger, that the Democrats are going to become more desperate to take him down, and you're already hearing them talk about he's got dementia, he's got mental health issues, he slurred his speech a little bit yesterday, apparently had some bridge work that needed to be done on his teeth, but they're claiming now he needs to show his medical records, his health care records. Uh, Joe Scarborough, Mika Brzezinski are saying he's not right in the head anymore. How desperate will the Democrats become now that the Trump economy seems to really be taking off? Well, I think they're on the verge of doing whatever it takes to overturn the results of the 2016 election. And I think they're desperately worried uh, about the economy and the direction it's moving in. And they're going to be even more desperately worried after House and Senate Republicans pass this tax bill, which is not a perfect bill by any stretch of the imagination. But I think uh, their attention has been concentrated. I'm, I'm hopeful they'll get it done before Christmas. I wish it had happened uh, six or eight months ago because I think the impact on the economy would have uh, been felt even more uh, fully by the time of uh, the elections in November of next year. Uh, but it, it shows what happens when the cloud of Obama and his ideology are removed, confidence in the business sector returns, more investment takes place, entrepreneurs take risks, more jobs are created, and everybody's better off. So this is, this is what Trump uh, promised to do. A lot of it's you know, due to the basic strength of our economy, but it's also due to eliminating the fear of crushing taxation and regulation, and I should say, obviously, the removal of a lot of anti-growth regulation, which has happened in the past year, has also been a major contributing factor. So absolutely, as the argument for average working men and women, why they shouldn't vote Republican, begins to disappear, uh, the Democrats have fewer and fewer arguments, and therefore they will grow more and more extreme. Ambassador, I know we're really up against it, the fact that Trump is a businessman and that we have, let's really a non-politician, a businessman now running our economy. Do you think that has anything to do with the high job numbers, the, uh, the declining unemployment, the booming economy, or does this just happen to be a coincidence? I, I think it's uh, related to it very directly because I think other business entrepreneurs know that uh, the president instinctively understands what they face. He's not a regular politician who can say one thing one day and appear sincere and change his mind the next day. I, to go back to moving the embassy to Jerusalem, which we were talking about earlier, here's another example of Trump not being a regular politician. Uh, like many other presidential candidates, he had said he would uh, recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. just turns out he's the first one to do it. So I think that uh, goes to enhance his credibility, and I think it's credibility across the board, not just in foreign policy, but in the domestic sphere as well. So what you're saying is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the he walk. He walks the walk, absolutely. Ambassador Dynamite Stuff, as always, we have been talking with former U.N. Ambassador, Fox News analyst John Bolton. Ambassador Bolton, have a wonderful, restful weekend. You too, and to all your listeners, take care. God bless you. 617-266-6868. Okay, coming up next, you got to hear this story. Charlie Baker, and partially, was elected in part to clean up DCF, the Department of Children and Families. New State Auditor report, ay yi yi pity the children. One twenty-two here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends, uh, something needs to be done. I've been saying this now for five years. Something needs to be done with the Department of Children and Families. It, uh, it was a mess, a disaster under Deval Patrick, and it continues to be a mess and a disaster, no matter what he keeps insisting or claiming, under Governor Charlie Faker. And let me be very, very candid with all of you, like I'm in the confessional. 
I have very few regrets in my life. I honestly don't. Okay? I really do not have many regrets. One of them is supporting Baker in the last election. And the reason why I supported him, full disclosure, is because you know my history, you know my family background, we have adopted two beautiful children. Uh, for me, children's issues, children's rights, it's personal, it's visceral, it cuts me to the quick. And I genuinely believed that at least for all of his rhino republicanism, that when it would come to taking care of the most vulnerable children, those in foster homes, those that are under the care of social services, the most neglected of the children, that at least under a Baker administration, because he vowed, he promised, in fact, he said it was one of his central promises, it was one of his top priorities, he said, was to clean up DCF and end the non-stop rampant abuse, and that's, there's no other word for it, the abuse of children that is taking place at DCF. And so far, it is as bad under Baker as it was under Deval Patrick. And Baker can stand there and say, oh, we've spent $100 million, we're hiring more social workers, we've put in new guidelines, blah, 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 blah. Children continue to die under DCF care, and children continue to be abused and be suffered, some of them, to be honest with you, almost tortured. And the culture of incompetence, the culture of corruption, the culture of covering up the crimes that are taking place continue under Charlie Baker's DCF. You phony, you fraud, you. And so yesterday was a bombshell report from the state auditor, Suzanne Bump, and I got to tell you, um, to me, honestly, I, this to me is not, it shouldn't be a Republican or a Democrat issue, a liberal conservative issue. It shouldn't, but it's always politicized in this state. I don't know how the supporters of Deval Patrick, mini me, could live with themselves. And frankly, now, I don't know, I don't know how the, the supporters of Charlie Faker, Chicken Charlie, could live with themselves in the wake of this state audit. Listen now to what the state auditor has found. Listen to this. From 2014 to 2015, these are now years that Baker was in power. Over 260 children under the care of DCF were systematically abused. And the abuse ranged, listen to this, okay? Listen to this. It ranged from a one-year-old baby suffering major first, second-degree burns, being burned by the person who's supposed to be taking care of them, or it involves children or young teenagers being stabbed, raped, sexually assaulted, assaulted with a baseball bat, some having suicide attempts because the abuse is so bad. And here is the kicker. It was all covered up. In fact, there were 19 cases that she found. I think it's much more, but she managed to find 19 in which there were uh, rapes and sexual abuse taking place, some of them by actual DCF employees. DCF employees at some of these residential facilities, two of them in particular, were sexually abusing and molesting young girls, three young girls. DCF covered it up. They covered it up to such an extent they refused to tell district attorneys to prosecute the cases or even to let them know what took place. And when confronted with this, one child, one teenager was shot in the head. Another 12-year-old had his brain smashed in by a foster parent. I'm talking about two, three, four-year-old babies with bruises and marks and burns on them. And when confronted with this massive epidemic of abuse, 
You know what DCF's answer was? It's not up to us. It's up to the doctors. It's up to the nurses. Because, you know, you're dealing with a, a much poorer population. So they go to mass health. And when they have mass health, and they come in and bring the poor kid in because he's been burned up or beaten or whatever, or the teenager shot in the head, well, um, you know, the doctor has to report to us. The nurse has to report to us. Don't expect us to ask our people to report to us. Or that we should report this to the um, Office of the Child Advocate, which they're supposed to do under the law. But let that go. Their answer is, wash their hands. Don't look at me. <laughs> Don't look at us. Hey, hey. No. Come on now. The families that we put children in, if they abuse those kids... It's up to the freaking doctors and the nurses to notify you? Are you kidding me? You don't do periodic checks? You don't do periodic reviews? In other words, you don't do your job, which is what you're supposed to do, and check in on these kids once in a while and say, hey, little Jimmy has a hole in the head. Why does little Jimmy have a hole in the head? Or, uh, you know, why do you have this 11, 12-year-old girl parading around in skimpy attire? Or they find out that DCF employees are molesting or abusing children and they deliberately turn the blind eye. Are you kidding me? And the same response that I get again and again and again is, well, we're going to have more reforms. Baker came out yesterday and said, well, we've got, got reforms, but we're going to have even more reforms. And we're going to have a blue ribbon commission. And we're going to investigate this some more. But we've got more reforms coming. I am sick and tired of the reforms. When are people actually going to be fired? When are people going to actually lose their jobs? When are they going to be held accountable? When are they going to lose their pensions? When are DCF employees like those two that were alleged to have abused three girls, when are they going to go to jail? When are they going to be prosecuted, indicted, and hopefully convicted? In other words, when are we going to start to hold government employees and people in particular at Children and Families, Department of DCF, accountable and responsible for their immoral and criminal actions? You know... You want to know why I'm against big government? Look at the corruption. I'm not saying it's perfect in the private sector. It's not. But look at the massive corruption and abuse of power that takes place. And the bigger it gets, the more corruption and the more abuse occurs. And notice how they're always feather bedding and protecting their own. 260 kids that we know of were abused dcf covered it up and refused to report it to law enforcement or the proper authorities don't talk to me about reforms chicken charlie don't talk to me about new guidelines chicken charlie don't talk to me about a hundred million dollars being invested quote unquote chicken charlie be a man have a real independent impartial investigation and start firing these hacks. 617-266-6868. Evan Heidenrich is in the WRKO newsroom where a former Massachusetts state senator, I'm shocked, is being accused of taking bribes in exchange for political favors. Hackerama lives on. Take it away, Evan. 137 here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends, you want to talk about a swamp? It's time to drain the swamp in Massachusetts. Not just D.C., but right here. And to me, maybe the mother creature of that swamp. Uh, the mother crocodile, boa constrictor, uh, snake, uh, whatever. Okay, whatever, whatever, lizard, is the Department of Children and Families. It is out of control. And yesterday, State Auditor, Massachusetts State Auditor Suzanne Bump, uh, in fact, even couldn't even hide her disgust. 
She said what she found completely shocked her and horrified her. 260 cases of children being abused or injured in the care of DCF. Some as young as one years old, little babies being burned. Other children being hit with baseball bats. Uh, others being sexually assaulted. Uh, some young female teens being raped. And all of this DCF knew about and covered it up. They either refused to report it to the advocate for the, uh, the, um, the uh, office for the child advocate, forgive me, or to district attorneys or prosecutors, including, by the way, two DCF employees who had a residential facility were assaulting and molesting three young teenage girls. This is criminal. I mean, really, with all due respect, this is criminal. And Baker, instead of owning up to this and saying, listen, this is a cesspool, and we got to start firing people left, right, and center, says, oh, well, we've already implemented some reforms, and this is a little bit, the data is outdated, and we've put in $100 million and 400 social workers. You can hire 40,000 social workers. They're not making their rounds. The upper management is thoroughly corrupt and absolutely incompetent. It's time to fire people, hold them accountable, and clean house. And yes, they need to start going to jail. 617-266-6868. Agree, disagree. Is the Department of Children and Families out of control? And again... Why do government hacks and bureaucrats get away with actions, in this case, abuse of power, that you and I could never get away with? You can also text us at 680-680. This is from 978. Jeff, I worked for the foster system for years. DCF is supposed to do a home uh, inspection weekly. I don't even think they're doing a home inspection uh, every six week, every six months. I mean, this is the problem. They're not doing their job. And these children are being abused and neglected, and DCF is either doing nothing about it, or even worse, deliberately covering it up and turning a blind eye. Um, another, uh, no, sorry, 617. Jeff, just talking with a visiting nurse last night who says they are ignored when they report children in the foster system in squalor and in abusive situations. Horrible stories. Uh, 617, where was the bombshell reports under Duvall? Doctors should report abuse, and Charlie can't drain the swamp overnight. No way Charlie and his wife don't want to clean up the abuse of children. DCF is a cesspool. Uh, and then you see, when you expose the corruption in the state and you use satire to try to do it, oh, it drives the moon bats crazy. Because this is supposed to be like Canada, like the mythical land of Massachusetts, where it's liberal utopianism and nothing ever goes wrong here. So when you expose the system and indict the system, they lash out. They don't know what to do. So in the face of all of these crimes, this is what the best they have. This is the best the moon bats have. 617. Um, Chicken Charlie. Ha, 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 ha. Jeff, you are so funny, and you should be a comedian. Your nickname's four people. He's so stupid. He spells it F-O-U-R instead of F-O-R. Anyway, your nickname's four people are some of the worst things I've ever heard and not funny at all. So don't listen. Like... The only idiot here is you. 617-266-6868. Aaron in New Hampshire. You're up first. Thanks for holding and welcome. Happy Father, Jeff. Thanks for taking my call, brother. You got it, buddy. All right, three quick points on this, and you already touched on the first. You know, if these are people, this, these families or these incidents, the ones that you were mentioning from age one to, to teenage years, if these in incidents were just solely the private sector and DCF wasn't involved, there would be some hefty jail sentences coming out, and most likely it would make the front page top fold every single time. 
And I think the fact that there were over 250 incidents and it didn't make the, any of the papers once, that's pretty sad. Second point, liberals always love to tell me about their puppy mills and the polar bears and the fact that it's not their fault. But you know what? It's not these kids' faults either. So have some consistency. Next time a liberal tells me about a puppy mill, how about being all, all uprooted over what's happening to these kids? And the last point, and, and I don't know how this is going to come out, Jeff, but at a certain point, I think we have to start realizing that this is a human being issue, where human beings just have to start doing something for other human beings. It's kind of like healthcare. Like, why are we pawning this off to the government? Why are we, are we too busy to do it? Are we just turning our heads because we don't want to see it? At a certain point, just human beings have to start caring about other human beings and do something about it at a larger scale without the government's help. Aaron, I mean, brilliant. In baseball analogy, you just batted a thousand. Bang, Thanks, bang, bang. Thank you for that call, Aaron. Look, to me, I guess, see, but even then, I'm telling you, look, the moon bats, they're all coming out of the woodwork now. Like some, see, this is what I find insane. You would think that the liberals who pretend, it's, remember, it's always the children, whenever they want to do anything. It's about the children. We've got to protect the children. Well, now you have real, living children being abused and neglected under the government agency that is supposed to be there to protect them. And instead of saying, hmm, hmm, uh, Boston, Boston, we have a problem. Massachusetts, we have a problem. Instead, it's blame me. How dare you mention it? Uh, I don't like your nicknames. Uh, wh whatever it is, something stupid. Oh, get out of If you hate it here, here's another one. You don't like it here, leave. This, 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 uh, see, in other words, you cannot expose the deep rot and corruption in this state. Because I'll tell you what they're afraid of. It's not just DCF. You go agency by agency by agency. And they know in particular when you've got children that are dying or being sexually abused or being assaulted, there was a boy beaten with a baseball bat. There was another child, a teenager, still, young child, shot in the head. How do you shoot a kid in the head? And DCF doesn't know about it? And they're covering it up? And nobody reports it to the office of the child advocate? And then even the auditor says, I, I'm talking to people at DCF, and they're all shrugging their shoulders saying, hey, don't look at us. The doctors have got to report this. The nurses have to report this. Don't ask us to do our jobs. So what are you there for exactly? I mean, I'm just curious. What do you do for a living? Your job is to take care of the children. And you're not doing your job. So if the government can't do it, I think Aaron was going there, and I think he's right, privatize it. Privatize it. Outsource it. I'm not saying the private sector is perfect, but it's going to be a hell of a lot better. Because the dirty secret about DCF is this. I'm not talking about... The frontline social workers. I, it's like the FBI. I know many of them are good, decent, caring people. I know that. The corruption is in the management. The corruption is at the top. And nobody wants to touch them. You know why? Because they're all political hacks. So until you get a governor with the balls, forgive me, with the stones, to say, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. And clean house, the children are going to continue to die. So the next time Charlie Faker, Chicken Charlie, comes to me and asks me for my vote, for the when he comes for re-election, Charlie, you know what? You had four years to clean up DCF. You didn't do it. From me to you, blank off. I'm going third party. John, you're up next. Go ahead, John. Good afternoon, Jeff. I, uh, I've been listening for a long time, and I've wanted to call many times. I love your show. Thank uh, you. I work in public safety, and I just wanted to tell you about a, a recent event that we had to call DCF from the police station, and we called three or four times on their you know, emergency notification line, and we either got hung up on or we waited about 40 minutes for somebody to answer the call. And uh, it was very disappointing. I thought that uh, listeners need to know 
that uh, sometimes uh, even the alarm, we can't even get hold of them. So I thought I would pass it on to you, Jeff. And uh, So, John, hold know. on. You have DCF experience, am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay, I don't want to give you away. I don't want to get you in trouble. And you're saying when you make calls to complain about neglect or abuse, people at DCF, they just they hang up? They just... They just well, we you have to call one eight hundred number, uh, Jeff. I guess it's some new uh, the governor's uh, some one eight hundred number, from what I was told. And uh, we called, and we've had we had three people calling, and one time uh, we would wait for thirty minutes, and then somebody would click the phone and it would hang up. So we called again, and finally, I think it was three times. We finally, got hold of somebody, and we had to wait you know forty minutes to an hour for somebody to come out. But we, uh, I had a couple of friends that I called that worked at DCF, and they said, oh. Even if you call us directly, we still have to call that same number you dial. And I said, you got to be kidding me. There's no uh, emergency number because we, we were kind of in a crisis. We had a child that needed, uh, his parent, both parents were uh, unable to care for him. And uh, we had to wait probably about two hours. The whole police department was tied up with a little bit, little uh, one-year-old. So I just wanted to pass that on, Jeff. Because John, a great job. Uh, John, uh, buddy, uh, listen, I want to thank you for this call. Can I ask you one quick follow-up? Yes, sir. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You're called whatever, uh, the police. They're called to a house. The child is being completely neglected. Or right. you find the child's been abused. Mm -hmm. 3 o'clock at night, you call this 1-800 number. You're telling me you got to wait an hour or two hours or three hours before somebody from DCF even manages to haul their rear end to the place? Jeez, I, 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 haven't, I usually work the early morning uh, time. And uh, I couldn't even tell you. Three. This was uh, probably about. I think this was like about eight o'clock in the morning, Jeff. And, they, and I don't think they get in till nine. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, they had, they got nine to five hours. John, they, you know, they used to call them bankers' hours. It's <laughs> nine to five, and don't bother me. <laughs> John, well, thank, thank you, you for that call. Great call. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Freddie and Beverly. You're up next. Go ahead, Freddie. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, why they don't care for these uh, kids. If maybe if they were illegal uh, alien kids, they would care for them. But this reminds me, I know someone uh, back in the 40s and 50s uh, in Massachusetts, there was the Fenald State School, originally called the Massachusetts School for the Feeble-Minded, which housed mentally disabled children along with those who were abandoned by their parents. And they were mistreated. Uh, they were deprived of meals. They were forced to do manual labor and abuse. And what they didn't know, too, is they were actually conducting experiments on these kids because they didn't care. They were, they were homeless kids and nobody cared for them. They were actually putting radioactive uh, materials in their oatmeal to see how it would affect them. And this was found out like four decades later that they were using these kids for experiments. Yeah. So it's nothing new that they abuse underprivileged kids like this. Ah, it breaks my heart. Thank you for that call, Freddie. Uh, no, you're right. I mean, I, I read stories about that as well. I just thought... We're in the 21st century. I thought we've evolved. I thought there are some things our common humanity could bring us together. But even in this state, it's political. It's, it's too... Jeff, 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 don't do that now. Don't rock the hackerama, Jeff. Don't you criticize DCF, Jeff. Hey, children die, children die. Uh, Kathy in Rochester. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm good. You know it really is DCF. I agree with you. I voted for Charlie Faker, and I regret it as well because he is absolutely useless. And for him to be elected and know what was going on DCF and, and just not doing anything as of yet, it really is a shame. I know a couple of people who are social workers, and the sad thing is you have great people who really care about the kids, but they get burnt out because it's just, it's almost like hopeless being a social worker I know. with DCF. And, um, you know, I don't know, years ago we had orphanages for children, and I really think that we should bring those back because at least they can control what goes on. You have these little kids in people's homes. I mean, it's really hard to control what's going on in a home. In an orphanage, I know it sounds cruel, but people could go and visit, take the kids out, but it's a much better controlled situation, I think, for the children. Kathy, um, uh, you know, Kathy, look, you make a very interesting point, and I want to ask you one quick question. How is it... You've got 260 reported cases. It could be a lot more. Children burned. Children shot in the head. Young girls sexually abused. DCF employees involved in abusing three young girls. Nobody has been fired. 
and no, nobody has been arrested. Kathy, how does that happen? How does that happen? Tom Baker needs to clean house. I mean, it is really, when you think about those fat pigs on Bacon Hill giving themselves a raise, because you know what they're going to say? Oh, we don't have the money to hire more staff. No, but they can sure soak the taxpayers for more money for the big pigs in the uh, state house. Well, put that money that those pigs have stole from us and put it to DCF and get the re- um, program the whole department and get things going because it is really a shame that these kids I mean these poor kids are already you know they're already broken hearts or yes. broken families yes. and then you have these people abuse them oh. you know fire them fire them all fire put them in front of a fire score even better is what I say Kathy don't be a stranger call again more with your calls next 156 here on the great WRKO. Okay, we've got Ronnie on standby. He's always a phenomenal caller. I think he's going to completely disagree with Congressman Gates, but I want to read one text. And this sums up the problem with DCF, the liberal courts, and honestly, liberalism in this state. Here it is. This this is the mother of all texts, as Saddam Hussein would have put it. 781. Hi, Jeff. I'm a foster mother. I got my child at five weeks old. Took two weeks for anyone to come check my house. This baby, listen to this, had fractured ribs, legs, and a skull. Done by the mother and grandmother. This child is now 20 months um, old. Um, We're just going to court now. And they are considering giving the child back to the mother. I have no say, no rights. I have to sit back and watch this child be put in danger. I told you that during the break. I said, the courts always give the child that has been abused back to the parents that have been abusing them. The courts always do that. A five-week-old baby. Broken ribs, broken, fractured ribs, fractured legs, a fractured skull. And DCF doesn't give a damn? And now the courts want to give it back to the mother who's abusing the child? When this foster mother obviously loves this baby to death? That's Massachusetts in a nutshell. Ronnie in Boston, you've got a full minute. The floor is yours. Go. I'll be quick, Jeff. I completely disagree with the congressman, and I was alarmed by the franticness in his voice that we have to do it now, now, now. The economy's booming. We control the presidency the house the senate we control the supreme court and hillary clinton is right where we want her out of politics disgraced and the humiliation of the election eating away at her every second of the day you you launch this investigation now she's gonna it's gonna be music to her ears because now you've given her an opportunity to become politically relevant again you've given you've given the democrats a martyr to rally around when they have none and she's going to become the joan of arc that fought those evil Republicans to the very end, and she'll get to completely rewrite her exit instead of where it is right now. Disgraced. Unless you have unconvertible, you know, uncontrovertible evidence to put her away, you maybe later, but definitely not now. It'll drag down the markets. It'll drag down everything. We've already beaten her. We've already beaten her, Jeff. So you're saying she's finished. There's no need for a special counsel. I'm saying that even if you've got her dead to rights, it'll drag Trump's agenda down so far and give the Democrats so much ammo and make her politically relevant again. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Barnstable County Sheriff under fire for wanting to check the immigration status of murderers in jail. Next. The voice of Boston is you. 680 WRKO Boston, 93.7 WEEI HD2 Lawrence Boston. It's 2 o'clock.